Now this is a story all about how the camera world got flip turned upside down. And this will take a few minutes, so just sit right there. I'll tell you how Canon created a groundbreaking camcorder, but most of the world didn't care. In Tokyo, Japan is where it was researched and developed, and then in the pros' bags is where it spent most of its days. Whether shooting B-roll or interviews, there were features under the hood that went on to do future cameras a lot of good. Even in low light, you didn't need to be scared because the VL lens had an aperture of 1.4 to let you film without a care. I searched for a cam, and when the results became clear, the listing said for parts, and it had a scratch on the rear. If anything, I thought that this camera could be rare, so I told the seller to buy it now and ship it by air. And that's where we find ourselves now. I've got this near 30-year-old camcorder that I bought as a prop for a different video, and now I don't know what the L to do with the L1. I've been working on a video about the Canon XL1. Now this is not the video about the XL1, although it is an excellent one in its own right. This was my dream camera when I was a kid. The original one came out in 1998, and then the XL1S, which is what this is, came out in 2001. And so it's over 20 years old at this point, but when I was a kid, this thing was my dream. I literally had a picture of it on my bulletin board. And this was a big deal because for about $4,000, you got a three CCD camera that had believe it or not, interchangeable lenses. Four to five thousand dollars is still pretty expensive, but that's much more attainable than tens of thousands of dollars, if not beyond that. And so I've been wanting one of these since I was a kid, and I finally bought one this past summer that's in like perfect working condition, and I wanted to make a video all about how this camera was so important because of the interchangeable lens. Much to my surprise, this was not the first camcorder with interchangeable lenses. It turns out that in 1991, Canon released a camera called the L1. And once I realized that, I knew I needed to talk about this in my XL1 video, so I wanted to get an L1. However, this sort of turned into its own journey, and that's what we're talking about today, because this thing, look at this camera, this is one of the most unique looking cameras you've probably ever seen, or never seen, really, because even though Canon sold it for a number of years, it wasn't a wildly popular camera. If you're like me and you were interested in cameras before the internet and YouTube made things super accessible, the place you might have seen this and wondered, what the heck is that camera, is in the movie Titanic. There's a part at the beginning where Bill Paxton is filming an underwater vlog, and he's using this crazy looking camera, and he's pointing out the window at the shipwreck, and it is the L1 with a different lens, with a wide angle lens on it, because you can change the lenses out. When I saw that movie in theaters as a kid, I was so curious about what kind of really cool looking camera he was using to film out the window of the submarine. Another place you might see it, another mid to late 90s movie that affected me as a kid was The Jackal with Bruce Willis. At one point in the movie, Bruce Willis ends up rigging up this, well not Bruce Willis, but his character ends up rigging this big machine gun automated thing together and he uses it to kill Jack Black in a tale as old as time. But the gun has some sort of automatic sight on it or something and basically this top panel of the camera is very, very prominent in it. The power button and everything is is all over the place and that, again, just struck me as interesting, but I had no idea that it was the same camera in both of those movies. And for some reason, I never thought of like, maybe I should look that up now that the internet is a thing and YouTube is a thing and I could probably find those answers. Never thought about it. It wasn't until I saw this camera featured on Cathode Ray Dude's YouTube channel, which is like one of my favorite channels. Please go check that out that I knew it existed and what it was. And that's when I decided I needed to learn more about it for my XL1 video. So this specific one that I'm holding here was manufactured in July of 1993, although they originally started producing these in 1991. This is the Canon L1. They also came out with an L2, which is pretty much the same camera. There's not really any differences to it. And this is largely also based on the Canon A1. So during the 1980s, when home camcorders became wildly accessible and much more compact and easy to use, companies were doing all kinds of different things to try to get people to buy their camcorders. And then the L1 came about as what would be considered a professional or a low-end professional camera because of the lenses. And what's fascinating about this to me is that we live in a world where it's not uncommon to use a camera that looks like a very traditional camera, but it can do photos and videos, a little bit of both, even with the same lenses and all that. We're pretty used to that at this point. 
But in the late 80s, people have been using film SLR cameras with interchangeable lenses for, you know, decades at that point. And people had now been using camcorders for a number of years. But to take both of these things and smash them together into a video camcorder that has professional features and lens compatibility, but has the familiarity of a camcorder, companies didn't really know how to approach that. And it sounds kind of funny, but if you literally take, here's a traditional camcorder where you hold it on the side and you can film everything. And then you take a traditional SLR camera, 35 millimeter camera. If I basically were to take this camera and put it on the back of this camera, something like this, that would be crazy, right? To have a camera that sort of looks like two cameras in one. That's kind of exactly what the L1 is. It's something that was designed to try and make video camcorder people feel comfortable while also making those who are used to changing out lenses and having more professional features also feel comfortable as well. And so you've got this camera body that looks like nothing else I've ever seen. Basically the backside of it, it looks like there's an SLR camera just sort of wedged on the back here and you can grab it by the grip and it feels very familiar to that but it also has a grip on the side so you can still hold it as a traditional camcorder and this does feel a lot better and there's just buttons all over the place everywhere you could put a button on this thing there is a button and there's several duplicate buttons multiple record switches it's fascinating because the camera as you can probably hear is very plasticky like it it feels like it sounds so if you're hearing this it feels like that. It's kind of hollow and plasticky, but the interchangeable lens is a really nice Canon L series lens that is fully metal. Like this is a heavy duty lens right here. And whoa, something you're probably not super familiar with. It uses a VL lens mount, which Canon did not make very many VL lenses. It's sort of similar to the story with the XL one which uses an XL lens mount, so you can't swap these lenses together, but I digest. And this is the standard kit lens that came with the camera. It's an eight to 120 millimeter F 1.4 lens. And of course, we're talking about sensors. We're not talking about full frame or crop sensor or micro four thirds. We're talking about a very small CCD sensor, and this is not a three chip camera. This is just a one CCD high eight millimeter camera. The XL1 on the other hand is a three CCD camera. So what that means is that while the sensor isn't necessarily bigger, which is kind of a measurement that we're used to today, bigger sensors, better image quality, the Canon XL1 has three CCD chips, one for each of the primary colors, red, green, and blue. The Canon L1 has one CCD chip that combines all colors. So basically what that means is a three chip camera like the XL1 gives you a separate chip to process each color, and then those are combined, essentially an entire regular camcorder's color processing power dedicated to each of the primary colors, which gives you significantly better image quality, low light performance, and all that. And so the L1, while still being considered professional at the time because of the interchangeable lens, does not have three different chips. It's just a single chip camera. But the point of this video isn't to just talk about the specs of this old camera, although those are interesting. I was able to purchase this entire thing for $40 on eBay. They're not hard to find used and on eBay. However, they're near impossible to find in working condition. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, is that a lot of these 80s and 90s electronics use components, resistors, flux capacitors, whatever, that just don't last, even if they don't really get used. This camera here, the Sony F35, which is another eight millimeter camcorder, I actually did buy this brand new just a few years ago. I found one brand new in a box. It had never been opened from 1989 and it doesn't work. It sort of turns on, but you can't actually get an image from it, which is very sad, very frustrating. And the reason for that is that even though it was never used, it was never abused, just decades, sitting and not being used caused things to just sort of start failing on their own. And I think given the, the relatively cheesy build quality on this camera, I kind of think that a lot of the components tended to fail and that's why you can't find working ones of these or at least ones that are listed as working. And so my $40 got me this camera and lens, which was super dirty and gross. So it took me a couple of days of very nice detailing to really clean out all the gunk and the grime. But fortunately, once I got everything cleaned out, this camera was actually in really good physical condition. It's not super beat up. It's not really stained. It has like a couple little scratches here and there, but 
it's actually in really good shape. And then I thought, well, hey, I wonder if this camera actually works. So back to eBay I went where I was able to find this, which is the Canon CA100 battery charger. It's basically for batteries that kind of look like this. It came with a dummy battery. And for Canon cameras throughout the 90s, maybe even into the 80s, these were really like the most common types of batteries. So this works on lots of other cameras. I was able to get this for like $20 and it works great. And I figured maybe I'll get another old Canon camera that needs it. So even if it doesn't work on this, it won't be a total waste. And it goes right in here. And now you can run the camera off of AC power. Here's what I did. I plugged that in. I was super excited, super nervous. There's a power button right here. I pressed the power button and the camera actually turned on. I was pretty excited about that. What I did notice was when I pressed the zoom levers, nothing happened. The lens didn't zoom. I couldn't hear the lens focusing. And when I looked through the black and white viewfinder, I didn't actually see any image, but there was text on the viewfinder, which showed me that the camera was alive in some way. It showed the counter, it showed dates, it said that it needed a battery, and it also kept saying lens flashing over and over again. So I thought, let's see what's that all about. And I took off the lens, and I cleaned all of the contacts on the lens and I cleaned all of the contacts in the camera and everything looks good. Even though it clicks in fully, the camera just does not register that a lens is attached. And so I thought, okay, the camera's busted or the imaging part of the camera's busted. However, I noticed something, which was when I took off the lens and I looked in the viewfinder, I could see flashes of light things were kind of changing, which showed me that the camera was picking up some sort of light. It was actually sensing the environment. And then looking through this lens, I noticed something interesting, which was that I could not look through this lens. Sometimes with camera lenses, what you'll notice is even when they're not connected to your camera, you can still actually see through them to the other side because the aperture is open. That was not happening with the lens from the Canon L1. So what that told me, was that the lens has its aperture closed. Probably when you connect the lens to the camera and turn it on, the aperture is supposed to open up so that way you can then adjust it. But when you turn off the camera, the aperture closes. And since the camera wasn't registering the lens, it was just staying closed. So now that I knew the camera was taking in light, my next question was, is the lens broken? or is the camera broken? Now you might remember that I said Canon didn't make too many different models of these VL lenses, but they wanted to sell this as a professional camcorder with interchangeable lenses, but it's hard to see the advantage of interchangeable lenses if there aren't that many lenses to interchange with. And this is something Canon still does to this day. Right now, one of the most popular things you can buy for a Canon camera is the RF to EF adapter, which lets you connect EF, their older lenses, to an RF camera like the R, R5, R6, R3, RP, you know, OG, and use those lenses natively. Well, Canon's EF lenses have been around for a really long time. In fact, they've been around so long that Canon actually made an adapter to use EF lenses with the L1. Somehow I had the best streak of eBay luck ever and I was able to find a VL to EF adapter that was brand new, still in the box unused. And you can see the original price tag from the camera store that it came from for $269. I got it for $35 and it's completely brand new with all the, you know, the instructions, the box, everything. It had never been used date of purchase blank blank 19 blank. So that at least gives you an idea of which millennium this came from. And here's the adapter itself. So unlike the EF to RF adapter, which is very small, compact, and lets you have full automatic features, full control over your lens through the adapter, they were still figuring things out back in the 80s. And this actually takes a little battery to help with some of the exposure and some of the different controls. If you take off the really adorable tiny lens cap, it does still manage to fit in right there on the L1. And now I have a really truly bizarre looking camera. So when I did this and I connected the dummy battery and powered on the L1, the camera turned on, but still nothing happened. I had the same thing that said lens. It wasn't registering that a lens was connected, but it was good because it told me that it wasn't the lens that was damaged it's something to do in the camera, which might actually be worse. I don't know, it depends on how you look at it. But then I thought, okay, whatever, I'm gonna pop a lens on here. So now I can take an EF lens, of which I have several. This is my Sigma 24 millimeter 1.4, one of my all-time favorite lenses, a really nice, beautiful, high-quality prime lens. 
that now I can mount onto this old camcorder. And then when I look through the viewfinder, I can actually see an image. And not just an image, but actually a really clear, good looking image. Well, I mean, it's, it's being used through a nice prime lens, which is great, but I was actually kind of surprised at how great the picture quality was on this thing. And you might remember that a while ago, I did make a video about how to use old camcorders with your computers for streaming using these little relatively inexpensive RCA to HDMI adapters. So I thought, well, let's see if I can connect the L1 to Ecamm Live and record some footage from it. So just on the side of the camera, there's a port here which has RCA outputs, and I believe also an S video output. And from there, I could connect it to Ecamm Live. I can see through the lens, it's all manual focus, but then I was able to get footage from the L1. And as I go around the room and kind of focus on different things, it's really not too bad. But for the first time in who knows how many years, this camera was seeing, capturing, and sending out an image. And so that just blew my mind right there. But there are a few limitations. First and foremost, this rocker switch here for the zoom is entirely useless and does nothing because the camera still doesn't think that there's a lens on there. This is just letting me connect a lens that has an open aperture. Now the downside is, since there's actually no communication happening through here, I can't control the lens's aperture through the camera, and this is not a manual aperture lens. So if I wanna change the aperture on this lens, I need to connect it to one of my EOS Rs, change the aperture to what I want, and then put it back on here. Unfortunately, I can't use this really cool zoom lens or see through this or see the quality of this lens. If you have any ideas of what I could do to make the camera work again, that would be awesome. And this camera does actually come with some rudimentary digital effects. There's like a close up right here which lets me punch in a little bit. That's actually kind of cool, especially in the world of YouTube where you punch in to make an impactful statement sometimes. There's an overlap feature, which is sort of like a weird cross dissolve. There's a lot of different versions, like a freeze effect where you can just freeze something and it's almost like a snapshot and you can turn it off and keep going where you were going. There's an art freeze. I actually don't even know what this is. Oh! Very, very retro. I'm, I'm not disliking this at all. So the effects are pretty limited and kind of strange, but they work. Like the camera is processing the different effects. And this camera does have a lot of really interesting controls, which is something that a lot of older camcorders tended to do anyway. But since this was geared towards professionals, it makes sense that it can do all of these things. Right here on the side, this is where the mode dial is to go from auto to manual. So if you turn this to auto, the camera does everything. If you turn it to manual, then you can start using all of these controls. And there's a lot of different ports on here. There's this door on the side that I mentioned earlier, which lets you connect different outputs and things. There's also an edit mode if you wanna record an external source onto your tape and use this as like a VCR for editing. On the back of the camera is where you insert the tape. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And then there's also a zoom rocker switch here, which I haven't gotten to use yet because it doesn't know that there's a lens attached. And then on the side over here, there's not much, but there is a big red record button in this little outcove. And then there's another shutter button here to record too. And of course you got the zoom rocker and then where you can install the battery. Now the top of this camera is very strange because that's where there are a lot of controls. You have all of your playback controls. You don't need to switch it into like VCR mode or play mode. You just press this and it will go. There's another record button right here, but it's next to this record button, which is also next to that one. So there's like three record buttons right next to each other. And on the side over here, you have some like counter information, but they even smash some buttons on the front here. This is where you can do your date and your title. And then the effects, if you can kind of see, the effect buttons are on the side up here. So you press this effect select button to cycle through the different effects and then you turn them on and off here, which is in a very awkward position. So the form factor on this is fascinating to me because you can tell that they didn't yet know what they were doing. And it's easy to go back and laugh at that and be like, those fools in the 80s and the early 90s, they didn't know what a camera should be. But there had never really been anything like this because aside from these super expensive like Hollywood film Panavision cameras and stuff like that, nobody was changing lenses on video cameras. The only people who were changing lenses on their cameras were people who were used to film photography. And the people who were taking video were the people who were used to camcorders that didn't change the lens. And so you can see 
the logic that Canon had in trying to make a camera that appealed to both people. So if you're used to changing lenses, this is gonna feel like your SLR. If you're used to camcorders, don't worry, it's still a camcorder. And <laughs> I'm not gonna say it was a wildly successful design, but it's a really fascinating design. There is a little thing on the bottom of the viewfinder that says tally lamp and sensor. So this makes me wonder if this actually did come with a remote control or something at one point. And I did a little digging while editing only to find that it did come with a wireless controller and it did come with a hi-fi stereo shotgun microphone. And then it does have some pretty interesting audio controls right here. So you can connect a 3.5 millimeter microphone, but it's also one that can draw power from the camera through a DC out. This is kind of a common thing in older microphones. It's basically how the XL1's microphone works, where the mic itself actually has two connectors. That's how it sends the input to the camera and draws the power from it. So you could do that here. And then you have this dual volume knob where you can turn everything at once to do the gain on your microphone or you can do it separately to do right and left channels and on the back you've got the lcd display which will not only show a counter but it will also show audio levels when you're recording so this is a very interesting camera and now this specific one once i got it to a point where it could actually see an image and i could get it onto a computer now I wanted to see if I could take it a little bit further. So the first step was to see if it could actually take a tape. And I was pretty scared of this because there's a lot of mechanics that go into the ejecting and inserting and loading of a tape. And that was where I kind of thought if this camera is really going to have some problem, it's going to be there. I didn't want to risk damaging any of the eight millimeter tapes that I have that have like actual treasured memories and old weird movies on them and stuff. So I had to order one, which these are shockingly hard to find now. This one had to come straight from Japan. I popped in the tape, closed it, and all the commands seemed to work. It would rewind, play, fast forward, and I would just see the fuzzy snow static on the tape. But when I tried recording, I wasn't getting an image, and that was kind of sad and disappointing. So I tried recording our dog and I was still just seeing the snow static. And I thought, oh well, I tried, but it just doesn't work. And then at one point through all the static, I could see the quick outline of our dog. And I thought, wait, it is actually recording something. Could it just be that the heads are dirty? So I got the idea in my head to clean the heads and see if that would work. Because fortunately, going back to Cathode Ray Dude's YouTube channel. He's in a few videos about how like video heads work and video players work. And that taught me specifically how to clean the heads. And so the quick explanation is that when I open this up, there's this drum in here. And that's where the video head is. There's a little, just a little slot on either side of it. So I just took some isopropyl alcohol and a little sheet of paper and just sort of rubbed it across that because I didn't want to get material from like a Q-tip stuck in there. And then I put the tape back in pressed record, and then when I played it back, I was actually able to see the image, which meant that the camera was recording on its own and delivering a clear output. And now the last step was to sort of take the camera off of this powered life support situation here so that it could truly be portable like it was intended when it was originally made. And fortunately, it's not that hard to find these batteries. Battery life's not great. It lasts like 20 minutes maybe but I could connect it here, do that, power on my Canon L1, and now I can go out and record mobilely. However, this camera has no built-in microphone, <laughs> and audio is half a video, so that was a problem. So I tried the microphone from the XL1, and it didn't work, but then I grabbed, uh-oh, but then I grabbed my old trusty Rode VideoMic Pro Plus, popped it on there, put it into the input. And basically as soon as I did that, the audio meters on the LCD screen on the camera started displaying levels and now I can record video and audio. I have a working Canon L1 asterisk because adapter and other lens that I can't change the aperture on, but it is a working Canon L1. Now 24 millimeters on here with this small sensor is not the same as 24 millimeters on here. So this camera needs to be like, very far away for me to be able to use it. But if I set it up here and hit record, now I'm kind of filming myself and recording my audio with the Canon L1. Now I'm kind of filming myself and recording my audio with the Canon L1. So now with a little more setup, this is a proper scientific test of the Canon L1's capabilities. I'm not actually even using this microphone though. I'm using the Deity Pocket Wireless, which works because the camera 
at 24 millimeters to get this wide of a shot, it had to be outside of the room where I film, across the hall, and the camera is actually in the laundry room and the Rode mic over there wouldn't work, so I needed to use a wireless mic. And I am using auto audio levels for this scientific test, so we'll see what the gain is like. But it's a great opportunity for me to tell you all about this. Because a lot of us know about the original photo encabulator, but for many years, engineers have been working to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a device that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing not just cardinal gram meters, but also cardinal gramp meters, you know, your grammies and your grampies. And instead of a base plate of prefabulated amulite, the new photoencabulator has a malleable parametric casing that allows for the spurving bearings to be in direct line with the panometric fan. And thus concludes our scientific test of the Canon L1 in a studio environment. So now I think that the only logical thing to do is to take my L1 camcorder and get the L out of here and go film. That is the condensed version, as much as I can make it, of my journey with the Canon L1, which all started as just trying to buy this camera body as a prop for a video I haven't even actually finished yet about another camera. But the story behind this camera is so fascinating to me for several reasons. Beyond just the fun of trying to get it to work and be usable in today's world, many decades past its original production, this by itself really represented something for where camcorders and personal video and professional and prosumer video were going or even developing. And so as easy as it is to laugh at this design, you can see things in here that directly influence later cameras. Specifically, you can see a lot of design elements, features and functionality from this, the world's first interchangeable lens camcorder, to the Canon XL1, which was really like the world's first genuinely usable pro level interchangeable lens camcorder that was also relatively semi-affordable to normal people. As I'll explain in my XL1 video, there are a lot of features on this camera and a lot of design elements that you can trace to current Canon cinema cameras. So Canon's C-series cameras, even their professional camcorders. So a lot of those things, you can draw a direct line back here to the XL1, which is originally released in 1998. And then you can take a lot of these elements and draw a straight line right back here to the Canon L1, which was the world's very first interchangeable lens camcorder. I think that this probably doesn't get the credit it deserves for being as important, as influential, as innovative, and as impactful in future technology as it really was. It's actually a ton of fun to use, even though it's not necessarily the most ergonomic. And speaking of things that are fun, thank you to everybody who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. I really appreciate it. It helps me to buy goofy old cameras like this. And if you want to know more about old cameras, like how to use them with your live streams and stuff like that, check out these videos right here to help you get the most out of that retro gear.